Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new video. This is a Castle Garden XC70 that I've just got for free. It doesn't run, I don't know anything about it, it doesn't have a collector box, it just looks like it's been left outside for many years. The battery is, I assume, dead. It doesn't look like it's been used for a while. It was manufactured in 2006 and it looks like it's been quite a few years since it was last used. Anyway, underneath this cover, we have the engine. It features a Briggs & Stratton Intec 6.5 overhead valve engine. But again, it just looks like it hasn't been used for a long time. It's full of cobwebs and leaves and all sorts of nastiness. So before I get it into the workshop, let's give it a good clean. Okay, I got it into the workshop. I can now give it a quick check over to see exactly what is wrong with this. It would be nice if I can just put some fresh fuel in, check the oil and then mow, but it's never as easy as that. So let's see exactly what is wrong with it. My first check is gonna be the oil. It's always a good starting point. So we'll see exactly how much it has in it. Okay, so it looks like it does have quite a lot in it. That is well over the full mark. Uh, and it also smells like fuel. So it seems like petrol has got into the crankcase. That's likely going to be a carburetor issue. Now this next part is really interesting. This engine must be fitted to many different applications, which means it has an integrated fuel tank, but this machine doesn't use it. It has its own fuel tank on the back. So it's just sort of got a bit this big bung in it you can still see the threads for where the fuel cap can go and i'm guessing the fuel tank is just like this big void there must be nothing in there at all completely inaccessible now moving around to the back of the machine where the fuel tank actually is i can see that there is no fuel in the tank which is a really good sign it's always good to have these things drain the fuel before putting them away for the winter or in this case maybe for several years um, and also it looks really clean so that's the first positive it's a three-speed with reverse. The gears seem to shift okay. That's good to see. The throttle lever functions, and I can see it is moving the control on the carburetor, so that's good to see as well. Okay, the engine does pull over okay, but that does get jammed uh, occasionally. It is also an electric start though, so hopefully we can start this engine off the key. So my next check is going to be underneath the air filter cover. We'll see if it has an air filter. And then we'll check for spark. Now it should have two screws, one here and one here. Uh, but this one's missing. How thoughtful of the person who lost it. It's given me a, an easier job. I only have to remove one. Okay, this should lift off. Yeah, I don't think that's been changed for a while, but at least it has one. Underneath, it looks fairly clean. The ignition switch is down here, next to the deck. I'm not too sure why. Maybe it doesn't work, or maybe they just lost the nut. But that should go just there. So I'll have to find a nut for it. We'll put it back. Because I've removed the air filter box, I have now revealed the spark plug. So this is a great opportunity to check for spark. I've got the ignition switch in the on position. The sensor on the back, which is for the collector box, has been joined together. 
so it thinks that the box is in place. Uh, the seat switch is bypassed as well. So really, this should work. We should have spark. Pop this spark tester in. I don't think we have any spark. There is a wire just down here, and that is the kill wire for the engine. So if I disconnect that, we can then basically figure out if it's an issue with the engine or with a sensor, because now the sensors are disconnected from the engine. Let's check for spark again. I've just put a block of wood in there to make it easier to see. No spark. So the issue is somewhere on the engine. Most likely the ignition coil. I have just found a replacement nut. It's a bit rusty, but it doesn't matter. There we go. So I need to make sure it actually works, but at least it's in position. As disconnecting the kill wire from the engine made absolutely no difference at all, uh, it means that it's not an issue with the sensors. So it must be an issue with the engine itself. So I need to remove the top cover. This will hopefully just pull through here. And then there are two screws which hold the red plastic cover on. Okay, so there are three more, three more screws. They are quite rusty, especially the back one, which was very stubborn to remove. Finally, there is one more bolt down here which holds the fuel tank on. And that is the fuel tank removed. Of course, there is no fuel line on here, as this tank is redundant, it's not being used at all. Now we have the top cover, so this is really getting close to where we need to be. We've got two bolts at the front, two at the back, the dipstick, and then that should pull off. So I've just rotated the dipstick, and hopefully that will lift off without any issues. There we go. So there is the ignition coil, and I can now test it to see if it works. Now to test it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the multimeter onto 20k ohms and then basically we need a reading between 2.5 and 5k. Okay, so we've got some bare metal showing as you can see. That's all we need. Put the positive into the end cap. Put the negative to here. And it looks like we have a good result, 4.59. So that means that the coil itself is likely not the problem. The next thing to check is the air gap between the flywheel magnets and the contacts on the coil. So I can already see actually that the gap on this side is much larger than the gap on this side. So it should be 10 thou. I'm going to start with 12. That goes in no issue at all. So maybe the air gap is wrong and maybe it's too tight on the other side. Let's just see what we can go up to. This is 15. Yep, 15 goes through. Now for 20, double what it should be. Yeah, that just about squeezes through. So that is out of spec on this side. Um, as I said, the other side looks much tighter. So I'll put it back to 10. Okay, 10 
just about fits through. But I can't see why that side would be causing the issue. This side is out of spec, so it needs to be reset. So I'll just loosen the two bolts first of all. That should allow me to be able to move the ignition coil, just sliding backwards. And then I can snug them up again. Then I can move the magnets into position. There we go. The piece of card to set the gap can be slid in. You can also use a business card. Slacken the bolts and it should snap into position. There we go. And then, yeah, I don't need to force it. Just tighten them up. And the gap is set. So now we have the correct air gap on both sides. So that might have been the problem. As you can see, it is so grimy under here. And before it's all put back together, this needs to be cleaned out. Also, before I do put the top cover back on, I really want to try and get the electric start to work. Because if we do have any issues with it, with the starter motor, then we're going to have to take the top cover off again. So uh, yeah, next step is going to be to clean it. Then we can see if it will turn over on the key. When I blow this all down with compressed air, it's going to put bits everywhere. So I'm just going to bung up the intake with some paper towel. Okay, that should be sufficient. Just crimp that. In the end, I decided to replace both of them. It just makes sense too. And it's quite nice that GGP, the manufacturer of this, actually sold a separate three pin plug charger for it. Okay, now for the new battery. Pink goes on to positive. It was one day red, but of course it's faded. And the black goes on to the negative. Okay, let's see if it works. I've got my weight on the seat. The pedal, the part brake is on. Uh, the gear shifter is in neutral. The rear bagging sensor is connected up so it thinks the bag is on and yet we have no life at all i'm going to bridge the gap on the solenoid that worked well the starter motor activated it didn't engage the flywheel though it might just be dry See if we can free it up a bit. There's quite a lot of resistance. It's probably a buildup of dirt and it hasn't been used much clearly. But at least it does work. The starter motor does actually spin. That's got it. Great, so we know that works, so it's probably the uh, solenoid. Following another check of all the safety switches, I discovered the one on the back, which I'd already joined together, uh, was actually broken further into the machine. So I've now replaced that, I've joined them all together, and hopefully it will now work. Well, the solenoid is clicking, so that's progress. But it's not enough to get it to go, so the, the solenoid might still be faulty. Or it might just want some persuasion. Ah, 
Nope, that must be faulty. Let's get it changed. Nice. Will it fire? Well, it did fire. Um, I don't know how well the smoke showed up on camera, but it absolutely poured out for the few seconds that it ran for. And the most likely reason for this is just because of the level of oil in the sump. I've just pulled the dipstick out and you can see the oil in there and it's like water. Well, it's actually more like petrol. It absolutely stinks of petrol. That is most likely the reason why it is burning oil. Because it is so full, the oil is just going straight past the piston rings. Now, usually on a rider mower, you can actually just drain the oil through a drain plug. Not with this one. Uh, it even says in the manual that you have to drain it by using one of these sucking tools. So it will suck it out through where the dipstick is uh, fitted onto the engine. So the pipe for the oil sucker just goes straight into the sump and then start pumping and it should pump it out of there. Well, I think that's pretty much got it. It's not really possible to completely empty the sump with this method, but it has got the, uh, the most of it and you can see, well, I don't know how well you can see actually, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is that is pretty full. It did have some in it originally, but it's a lot fuller than it was before. There we go. There's a good view into the sump. So you can see it's very empty there. Now just draining the sump and putting fresh oil in is not going to fix this problem. The issue must stem from the carburetor. The petrol must be leaking through into the sump, so it's most likely the needle or the seat or maybe a stuck float. Uh, for whatever reason, petrol is continuing to get into the cylinder when the engine is not running. Now, unfortunately, there really isn't good access and all this plastic body panelling in the way makes it very difficult to show you with the camera. So I'm just gonna remove the carburetor and then we'll get it onto the bench and then there'll be a much better view. Right, so with the two bolts removed, that'll just pull out. And there we have the carburetor, so I can now remove that. There we go. So let's take a look inside the carburetor. I'm not too sure if there's gonna be any fuel in it. Probably unlikely, since the tank is dry. But this will be interesting. Okay, not too bad, definitely very dry. It would be nice to be able to remove this gasket without damaging it. But that's probably not gonna happen. Right, so the issue is likely with the needle valve for the float. Slide the pin out. That is the needle, which looks to be in good condition. So it's likely the seat 
which is down in there. You can see the red seat in there. I've put the carburetor back together again and I've put some fuel into this tank. I'm going to raise the tank up above the carburetor and that will allow the fuel bowl to fill and we'll see if it overflows out of here or the other side. Uh, it shouldn't do. It should stop filling once it reaches the correct level. And there it goes. So that fuel would now be going through the intake into the engine. It would tend to seep past the rings and that's why we see it in the crankcase. And now of course it is full of fuel. So just drain that. I'm going to have to change the seat. If I get a kit, I can just change the needle as well. Just change everything. So you can see all the fuel is just draining out of there. I did check the main jet and that looks to be clear. Although I will give the entire carburetor a really good clean before it's reassembled. Well, that's it all disassembled again. I've just checked and I do have a valve and a seat. It's actually a kit, so you get both. Uh, it's now time to clean everything. I've just cleaned the outside with some carb spray just to get that initial grime off there. Uh, everything else can be done in the ultrasonic cleaner, which I have just here. And I do usually just put some washing up liquid dish soap in here. Just a quick squirt and that will just assist with the uh, grime removal. I've got more water to add soon, it's just heating up. And then we have the jet, the pin, and the bowl itself. There is also the float, uh, which I, I'll probably just float in there. You can put it, try and trap it underneath, but really they clean up pretty easily. So I'm not too worried about the float itself. And obviously the needle valve is gonna be replaced, so I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's just, yeah, we'll put it to one side. And then once I've cleaned everything, I'll pick out the seat. You can do that first, it really doesn't matter, but yeah, it's just the order I'm doing it in. So I'm going to get the uh, top up of hot water, and then we'll switch it on. Okay. Whilst the ultrasonic cleaner does its thing, I should now be able to flip up the entire mower so I can inspect the deck. There's no oil and there's no petrol in it, so nothing should leak out. It is extremely light. Okay, there we go. I do like to think of these as ride-on push mowers. Because the deck is about the same size as a really big walk-behind mower. But you get to ride it, which makes it more fun. Okay, so actually... Um, well, apart from the blade being on upside down, <laughs> it doesn't look terrible. Yes, that blade is on upside down. Amazing. So as you can see, because it was on the wrong way, they've been mowing, not very much, but they have been mowing a bit on the back edge of the blade. This is the cutting edge here and it's never cut a single blade of grass, so all that needs is a clean. It doesn't need a sharpen, because it is basically new. Rusty but new. Yeah, it looks like they did fit it and then the mower broke. So that's a good blade. Well, there we go, 25 minutes in the ultrasonic cleaner. With the heat, they should just dry off, they should just evaporate.
Well, it's all looking a lot better. The bowl has come out really nicely. There's the main jet, the float, which was floating, the pin, which wasn't even that dirty, and the carburetor body itself. But yeah, that's all looking a lot cleaner. So now I'm just going to dry everything off with the airline and then I'll pick out the seat. And there we have it. So yeah, I've likely just done more damage to it, but that doesn't matter. It looks quite perished. It's probably just perished. So that can be replaced with a new one. And hopefully that will solve the problem. And now just to make sure everything is nice and clean, I'm just gonna spray some carb cleaner through all the passages, making sure it's all as clean as possible. And the same with the jet. I've got the new needle and seat, part number 398188. So I'll just drop it down into there. And then with a flat punch, I can just gently press it into position. And there it is, you can just see it in there. So that is the seat installed. Now the rest of the carburetor can be reassembled. The part number for the bowl gasket is 693981. Just making sure it isn't twisted. And then we're ready to put the bowl on. I think the gasket here is reusable. And once this is done, I can give it a test just to double check to make sure it isn't overflowing. So just attach the fuel line and we shouldn't see any fuel overflowing out of it. looking promising. That's great news. So I can hear just by shaking it very gently that the bowl has filled up with fuel. Also it's considerably heavier, uh, but yet nothing is coming out of areas where it shouldn't be. All I need to do is reinstall the carburetor and of course all of the other components. I have also bought a new breather tube, part number 692937. If you don't have a good breather tube, like if it's all perished or cracked, uh, or even missing altogether, you might find the engine doesn't run correctly. And I've also got a new gasket. You can't really see that in there, but it is part number 692667. And that is for the carburetor. It's this gasket here. And that fits just there on the carburetor.
Well, quite clearly this tyre is very punctured, so I need to take the wheel off the machine first of all. Then I can remove the tyre from the rim and I can check for any thorns or any of the sharp objects which have penetrated the tyre. There's no point putting another tube in without checking that first. The nice thing about this machine is it's so light that you can just lift it up by hand and stick it on an axle stand. The wheel is held on with an E-clip, which just pops off. There is a washer and then it will just slide off. You can see the inner tube in there. The valve stem has pulled through. So I'll just put this onto the tyre changer and then I can inspect the inside of this tyre. The tyre actually looks quite good. It's got lots of tread. It's not perished. So it just needs a clean, quick check and a new tube. This one should be pretty easy. With the old tube out, I can now keep the tire like this, just partially on the rim, see if there's any thorns in there, and then just lift it up and feed the new tube into here. Just feeling around on the inside, see if I can feel anything sharp. Yep, there's something just there. There we go, a thorn, just there. If I can feel it, so can the tube. So it will just very easily pop a new tube, making uh, replacing the previous one pointless. So I'll just very carefully pick that out of there. There we go. That's the whole thing, including the sharp point. And I think that is everything. That looks to be thorn free. So I've got a new tube. Let's get that fitted. So this tube type is one with a right angled valve. So I need to make sure it's in the correct place. And what I like to do is put a fuel line clamp on it so it can't pull through whilst the tyre is being mounted. Now I might be able to get away with not using any tyre mounting compound on here because it is such a tiny wheel. Just got to be careful not to nip the inner tube. And there we have it. Just give that a very quick smear of grease. And then we just have the washer and the e-clip. And that's the wheel fixed.
Well, that engine is looking quite good. As the engine has warmed up, it's burnt off that oil from when it was overfilled and it has cleared. And I think we're now ready to cut some grass. Well, almost. I think first it would be quite nice just to make a very simple deflector because currently this chute is just gonna fire grass up into the air. It only needs to be really simple just to keep the grass down a bit. So I've got some pieces of scrap metal just down here. As you can see, I think if I can just make something really basic out of these offcuts, that would be good. I think something like this rod here would be perfect for holding onto the machine. And then like the box section would be good for holding it away from the chute. And then of course the sheet metal is the main plate, which the grass will hit. And then hopefully that will allow it to distribute a bit. It won't just clump up and stay in a great big pile. Before I weld the lower box section sort of support and ballast bar on, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to show you what it was going to look like roughly. Um, the reason why I call it a ballast bar is because obviously when the deck is engaged, it's going to produce a lot of wind and it will just blow that flap fully open, rendering it completely pointless. So yeah, having the extra weight without actually bolting it down should help, hopefully. So I just need to basically weld the flap onto there. And just to remind everybody, this is just for the test really this is uh, it probably would work you probably could mow like this long term but yeah it's just so that we're not throwing rocks and everything everywhere because the area which i test these mowers on is not exactly a lawn it is just a piece of rough ground And there we have it, a nice quick deflector. It should do its job. Uh, it might not be pretty, 
but as long as it works that's all that matters and because we've got this curve on the top here that should prevent the grass from coming back up and hitting me. Um, some of these actually that you can buy do have sides to them but all that's going to really do is act like a combine harvester and it's going to create a swath so yeah we'll have to see how that goes we'll have to see what sort of finish it leaves uh, although yes it will only be mowing weeds not really grass as such but yeah it'll be interesting I should think it'll all come firing out the sides uh, as much as it does underneath but yeah nice fun test we have it it runs drives and mows and actually i think it's left a really good finish my deflector also seemed to work very well it didn't get blocked and it did deflect it nicely it didn't come firing back at me i can't really see any reason why that wouldn't work for longer term mowing i suppose having thicker steel here would be uh, beneficial but yeah otherwise it seems to be great and having no size didn't seem to affect anything either and uh, it was nice that it didn't all come firing back up onto me or collecting around where the, uh, the fuel filler cap is because uh, that would not be very good. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll be putting more out really soon. Please also do remember to like the video. It's always very much appreciated. And until the next one, see you again soon.